The Oshawa Airport brings back a lot of memories. Most of them happy and some of them sad, as I remember some of the people that were here with me at the time, and they're people that never returned. Oshawa's clear skies helped to prepare thousands of Allied flyers for the job that they had to do in defeating the Axis powers and bringing peace back to an embattled world. In fact, Oshawa and its neighbors did more than its fair share in fighting the tyranny that threatened to enslave the world as we knew it 50 years ago. This area mobilized thousands of men and women to fight on the battlefields and in the air and on the sea. Many of them paid the supreme sacrifice and are buried and marked in unmarked graves in areas all around the globe. And what makes the Durham region so unique is that so many of its civilians joined the battle in whatever way they could. And I'm not just speaking about the loneliness of going about their everyday lives while loved ones fought and died across the seas. And I'm not just referring to the shortages of food they endured or the restrictions that was on their freedom. Canadians all across this country willingly or at least resignedly put up with these hardships in order to see peace restored. And where the people of this area went that extra mile was in the way they dedicated their every working hour to the cause. Those were the people who helped run Camp X, the International Training School for Spies, who soon would be on unbelievable or taking unbelievable risks as the infiltrated enemy territory. James Bond's creator, Ian Fleming, trained here. And, you know, several friends of mine trained here as well. Famed actor David Niven, the English actor, trained here, as well as Hugh Downs, who you currently see on the 2020 program on television at night. And I can tell some stories about those fellows and what they did here. The municipality of Ajax was created to house those brave civilians who risked their lives on a daily basis in the manufacture of munitions for the war effort. And men and women from all over the region put in tireless hours day after day, week after week, year after year, as General Motors turned its car and truck works into a gigantic military operation. Army trucks, tanks, armored personnel carriers, and the fuselage for the famous Mosquito Bomber, all the machinery necessary to help the Allied war effort rolled off the General Motors assembly lines. And without this equipment, our fighting forces would never have been able to stem the tide of aggression and none of us would be enjoying the comfortable standard of living that we enjoy today. And that includes our freedoms. And that's why the Oshawa Aeronautical Military and Industrial Museum came into being, not to glorify war. Anyone who has gone into battle will tell you that war is insanity and that peace must be preserved throughout the world with every means at our disposal. But a wise man once said that those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. And that's why we must remember the sacrifices of those who struggled in whatever way they could to bring peace back to a war-torn world. There's a lot to be proud of here. Let's take a few moments while Marc Giroux, one of our volunteer curators, explains the significance of these exhibits. Welcome to the Oshawa Military and Industrial Museum. This is a, a, a museum put together, and it's, it's been a long time dream of many members of the organizations that make up the museum. We have the military section and in the industrial section. Uh, during World War II, the British Army was stranded in, in the southern half of France on the beaches. Well, when they evacuated, they had to leave all of their equipment on the beaches. 
Well, when they came back, there were massive orders to be filled for tanks, machine guns, uniforms, and equipment. Well, Britain had to convert over to an air war, so all their factories and industrial sections were converted over to make aircraft. Now, here in Canada, we're, well, in the United States as well, were placed orders for machines, uh, tanks, machine guns, uh, uniforms, and trucks and soft skin vehicles. Here in the museum, we try and show the industrial explosion that happened in the local area. In Oshawa, companies such as Coulter's, Peoples, The Fittings, General Motors, and other smaller subsidiary companies, and how the town, towns like Ajax built up just from war production itself. Um, I'd like to take you through the tour of the museum now and show you various pieces of equipment that are special to us and maybe to you. This is our first piece of equipment. It's kind of special to us. It's one of two ever manufactured. Um, it's nicknamed Tiny because of its size. It weighs 10 tons. It's a 1,500 weight armored ambulance. General Motors here in Oshawa made two of these off a basis of a truck they were already making for the Canadian and British armies. This has four passenger carrying ability as an ambulance. Goes probably 25 miles an hour downhill with a clutch in with a very big wind behind it. Uh, they're not a very fast vehicle, but they're designed to keep up with armored columns during the Second World War, which weren't that fast. Now, this ambulance served with the British Army of the Rhine between 1945 and onwards into the 60s, where it was then released from the Army and ended up in a scrapyard in Holland, where a man from England took it and restored it. He then, for the price of transport, donated it to the Canadian and War Museum. We have it on loan to redo the wiring from plastic harness wiring, which he used at the time, to the proper cloth harness wiring. This is another piece in our collection. It's kind of kind of a nice little prize for our regimental history books. This is a Willys pattern Jeep made by Ford in Windsor. This Jeep was issued to the Canadian Army in 1942 and then issued to the Ontario Regiment, to then a young lieutenant by the name of Ward Irwin. This was issued for the inv invasion of Sicily. When they landed in southern Italy, his armored car was traveling down a supposedly cleared road. It hit a landmine and rolled over. Now the story goes he was pinned under the armored car, his arm was pinned, and he was under there for between 9 and 48 hours. Because of the loss of blood, he lost his left arm. But before he left, he told his batman and his brother, take care of my kit and take care of my jeep. Well, Ward never saw it, was never with the regiment again until after the war. He was sent to London for convalescent leave, and then he stayed on staff in London as a wounded field officer. When he returned back to Canada, he met his brother in, in Oshawa, and he said, well, we have your Jeep sitting in Trenton. What do you want us to do with it? Well, both of them come up with a plan to scour the countryside to find a scrap Jeep to turn into the, to the Army for this Jeep. So he took it to the Interior Regiment Fair Club, which is one of the earlier sections of this museum. It does all the vehicle restoration. We got it done. It took us two years to finish the project. Two years, we got it done. Ward took it home. Two weeks to the day he took it home, he passed away. His wife thought it was such a great effort on our part to put this Jeep together that she donated it so that we could parade it with the regiment and keep it in our regimental history. And here we have it on display as a proud, proud memory of the Second World War and our part that the reg local regiment had done. Here it's setting up. This is his wife has brought in several pieces of equipment. One of the pieces was his actual issued field chair. And I've set up a little. One of the soldier's favorite things to do when he has time is take off his shoes and his socks and check his feet and let them rest. And I've set up that type of display with the boots and the socks beside his chair. This vehicle here is set up in the back half. It's a radio command center. 
during the Second World War, they would have had two, maybe three radios in the back of this. It would have been crewed by two people. Now, what I've done here is tried to set up a personal effect of what the vehicle would have been like in service, what two men would have had to, to put up with each other and how to live with each other with all their, their sleeping bags, their blankets, their equipment, all on the back end of this, plus the radio. The radio in there is a good example of Canadian Lend-Lease equipment. If you look at the radio, you'll see that it has English and Russian italics on it. That's because we made those radios for mass production for use in our armies, the British armies, as well as lend -lease to the Russians. Now, this vehicle would have been set up, setting up radio nets to establish communications between tank troops or between infantry regiments or infantry companies. Uh, and we've tried to set up the personal standard of what it would have liked to have been in that truck at the time. It may be deceiving from this height to look at it and think there's nice tall room in there. I have to stand in the truck like this to be able to move around in there functionally. That should give you an idea of how big it was. Now this truck here was built here in Oshawa. And when you see the front of the truck, you'll notice that it has a round cupola on the turret. That round cupola was the first production. This truck was the first production model with that round cupola. It was a rearward action vehicle. It stayed in a, in a behind the lines roll. And they decided that if it had a round cupola on it, they could put a machine gun on it. Before that point, it was a square cupola. That was for the guy sitting in the passenger seat to stand up and watch the road at night because the headlight they used in combat at night was this big. And that would make the, the viewing a lot easier to tell the driver if there was a hole in the road or if uh, the person in front of him had fallen off the road or the vehicle was blown up or, or if the driver couldn't see where he was going very well because of the high, high seating on the truck. The basis for our vehicles collection started off with nine ferret armored cars. Here we have two prime examples. The ferret armored car came off the production line in 1949 as a prototype. In the mid-1950s, the Canadian adopted the armored car for reconnaissance roles. It stayed in the Canadian Army until 1978. It has a six-cylinder Rolls Merlin engine in it. It has 145 real horsepower. It has a pre-select transmission, same transmission that went in the Leyland bus. It has a forward reverse lever, which allows it to have five speeds forward, five speeds reverse has four-wheel independent drive and independent suspension on each wheel as well. Weighs four tons and has a crew of two. Now the manual says it'll go 55 miles an hour, but being good Canadian soldiers as we were, we found out they'd go upwards of 70 miles an hour. Here we have a Mark II. This is a Mark I. It has no turret. The Mark II has a turret. Now the turret was a gift from the Royal Regiment of Wales, sent over from Wales off a, a range target, and we put it on our ferret to show the different versions that were made. Here behind me, we have the M24 Chaffee tank. It's a light tank. It weighs 18 tons. It has twin Cadillac V8 engines in it. it has a hydromatic transmission, a 76 millimeter gun, angled armor, and individual torsion bar suspension. 100 were purchased by Canada. They were issued to the militia for testing and trials. Eventually, they just petered out of the system. Well, we've covered a very little bit of history in the local area today. Most of the vehicles I've covered do have intricate histories to them. We also have a few more vehicles that you didn't quite get to see. So why don't you come on down and see whether you've been in the military or not, or you've, you're involved in local history, come on down and see what we have to offer you. I'm pretty sure you'll be quite interested. Thanks, Mark. We're lucky to have someone with such an obvious interest in this equipment here to tell us all about it. But there's much more to this museum than just vehicles and machinery. Many area residents have very kindly donated uniforms, equipment, medals, photographs, and other memorabilia. We have a young soldier here to tell us all about it. My name is Sergeant Dale Gray. I'm a member of the Ontario Regiment here in Oshawa, and I'm also curator of the Ontario Regiment Museum. The museum collection was uh, amalgamated over the years, 
and uh, the chief person involved in getting this collection together was a gentleman by the name of George Fox. The first areas that we had for, st for, for displaying our articles, were at one place was Parkwood at McLaughlin's house, and the other place was at the Armories. We were finding that the collection was so large that we didn't have enough room to uh, properly display and house the amount of artifacts that we had. So this past year, we were lucky enough to come in contact with the people running this museum, and the regiment was lucky enough to be able to house its collection within this museum. Um, over behind me here, you'll see uh, the pre-war period from uh, approximately 1930 to 1939. The, uh, the monarchs of the time, which was uh, King George and his wife Queen Elizabeth. The flag in the middle is that of the Canadian Ensign, which is the flag that this country flew before the uh, Canadian Maple Leaf came in. The uniform is, uh, was a 30s pattern uniform. It was the very first pattern uniform that was given to the Canadians after the First World War. It was worn up until 1939, and uh, at that time when war was declared, in September of 1939 by the Canadian government. The, uh, they got rid of the old dress uniform and went to the new combat battle dress uniform, which is a short blouse. Our next scene you'll see is uh, a Sicily scene, and in that scene you will be shown how the uniform had changed from the 1930s. At 4.15 p.m. on September 1st, 1939, the regiment was put on active service. The Canadian government had just declared war on Germany. On June 25th, 1940, the regiment set sail. Uh, they landed in Greenwich, Scotland on July 1st, and uh, from there on, they were stationed in uh, southern England, and they were issued their Churchill tanks and started training in their armored duties. In July of 1943, the regiment uh, landed ashore in Sicily, and all through Italy, the regiment fought in some of the most inhospitable country. In this scene, we have uh, an officer and a senior NCO from the Ontario Regiment. The, uh, they've got an uh, observation post set up. The officer is in his tan uniform of the time, which is his summer dress, with his gas mask and canister inside the bag. His uh, webbing is on. In his hand, he has a, a 9 millimeter Browning high power, which was uh, made by Browning Inglis of Canada, and uh, he's all ready for action. Uh, once the weather started getting a little colder in northern Italy, the, the regiment and converted back to wearing their battle dress. It was much warmer, and uh, in this scene there is a, a sergeant of the Ontario Regiment. He's wearing his black beret, which denotes an armored unit. In his hands, he's got a Bren gun, and it's sticking out of a window, and he's keeping his eye out for enemy, enemy patrols that might be coming down the road. The chevrons on his sleeve, uh, the red three stripes, uh, denote him as being in for three years. The stripes on his sleeve are that of a sergeant. The, the black, red, and black uh, diamond that's on his sleeve is an armored regiment, and in this case, it's the 11th Canadian Armored Regiment, the Ontario Regiment Tanks. In this scene, uh, we have an ideal trench. Um, I say it's ideal because uh, it doesn't really show the slime and the mud and the rats. In 1914, the, uh, the German army uh, were experimenting the use of chemical warfare, and in 1915, the first uh, gas was released at a place called Yeeps, which is in Belgium. The Canadian Front uh, was the only line that held uh, after that attack, but the British found that they needed to bring out some sort of form of protection for their infantrymen from the effects of chlorine gas. In this case, it was the first pattern British uh, bag gas mask. In this scene, we have an officer uh, he has three pips on his sleeve, which denotes captain. And he was always immaculately dressed in the field. He uh, was always showed up with his boots polished, his uh, uniform cleaned of mud, and his tie properly tied. And uh, the good thing about it was that uh, he always had a batman to do it for him. He was uh, just give his kid over to his batman. He would clean his clothes and do his boots for him. The 116th Battalion was raised in 1916. It uh, went overseas as a complete battalion. The officers uh, usually had a little bit of difference to their uniforms. 
The, uh, in this case, the, the badge itself, the 116th Battalion badge, is a gold badge with a silver front on it. The other ranks would have had a straight badge, a uh, brass one, and it would have looked exactly like this, except, like I said, it would have been a brass. Each uh, unit, uh, as part of their designation, they also wore what they call collar dogs. And uh, these collar dogs helped to identify the unit if they happened to lose their badge. It also helped to identify uh, dead or wounded personnel who uh, may not have any identity papers or identity discs on them. In this case, the officer is wearing uh, collar dogs of the 116th Battalion. The officers usually wore a, uh, a style of equipment called the Sam Brown equipment. This equipment was designed by an officer in the British Army who lost his arm and uh, he, d he designed a uh, type of equipment that would enable him to get out his pistol and his sword quite easily with his one hand, and this was brought into as a regular service dress for officers. The, uh, this type of Sam Brown was kept in existence in the Canadian Forces up till the 1970s. Uh, Canadian militia units have been formed in Canada ever since the very first permanent settlements were started by the French. Um, during the troubled times of the 1860s, uh, several small rifle and infantry companies were formed in Ontario County, but there was no real coherence between the units. And after June 2nd, 1866, after the Fenian raids, the, the Canadian government finally realized that uh, it was time that we started a defense policy of our own. And all these little rifle and infantry company units, 10 in number, in Ontario County were amalgamated into the 34th Ontario County Battalion. In this scene, we have uh, an officer and a rifle companyman who is in the red uniform the infantry officer in red uniform and a rifle companyman in the green uniform, uh, which are representative of the 1870-1880 period. The 34th Battalion had a, has a long history within Ontario County, which is now Durham Region, and our regiment is, is proud to be descended from that regiment. As you can see from this plaque, this is the George Fox room. This is our orders and decorations room, as well as our photographic room. Uh, as you will see, off to my left here, uh, we have photographs of the 116th Battalion, which is the regiment that was uh, formed here in Ontario County in 1916. Their main training base was at Camp Niagara, which is uh, near present-day Niagara-on-the-Lake. And uh, they complete their basic training, and from there they were entrained to Halifax and boarded the Olympic which was a sister ship to the Titanic, and landed in Liverpool and headed right straight to Salisbury Plain for further training. And after the training in England, they jumped ship and landed in La Harve in France and then was directly located at the front lines. The uh, 116th Battalion was part of the 3rd Division, 9th Brigade, and uh, they fought with distinction from uh, 1916 until the end of the war. Uh, on my right, uh, is the Ontario Regiment Tanks, which is the unit that fought in Sicily, in, in Northwest Europe, in Italy. And uh, the photographs represent all those squadrons that were uh, at that time stationed in England in 1943. And as well as we have orders and decorations from that period as well. Also in the George Fox Room, we have uh, Colonel R.S. R. S. McLaughlin's Order of Canada. Colonel McLaughlin was an honorary colonel of the Ontario Regiment uh, from the 1920s up until his death. In uh, 1967, he was awarded one of the first Orders of Canada. This concludes the tour of the Ontario Regiment Museum, and we encourage people to come down and to see our museum as a whole. If you have a member that served in the Canadian Forces, uh, it doesn't matter at what period of time, a uh, grandfather, a father, an aunt, an uncle, a mother. We encourage you to come down. We can uh, help you get on the track of doing research for your family. We always encourage artifacts being brought down for us to identify and uh, possibly help out with identification and uh, give you a good idea of what they're worth. We also encourage donations to the museum, which can be put on display under your name for, for further people and other people to come in and look at. And I would like to take this opportunity on the behalf of the commanding officer, the officers, the senior NCOs and men of the Ontario Regiment for coming to our museum. And I hope to see you down here. Thank you.
Thank you, Sergeant Gray, for a very interesting description of some of the displays that are here on public view. The current plan of the directors of the museum is to expand the aeronautical and industrial areas. So there you have it. I hope we've raised your interest level about the kind of exhibits that are in store for you during your visit to the Oshawa Aeronautical, Military and Industrial Museum. But we'd really like you to do more than just visit. Many attics in the Durham region contain military memorabilia that's gathering dust and mildew. So why not dig it out and donate it to the museum? Better still, why not get involved in helping to run the operations here? These exhibits just don't land on the doorstep. They take many hours to get them into the shape that you've seen them today. It takes the efforts of many dedicated volunteers to run an operation like this one, and they sure would welcome your assistance. Or if you can't spare the time, why not consider making a donation to help them in their plans to maintain and expand the museum? All financial assistance is tax deductible. Whatever help you can give will assist in this project to honor the efforts of the many thousands who struggle to bring peace back to a world torn by war and turmoil. This is part of our history right here, and we all need to work together to see that it is preserved. Your donations can also help the museum with its plans to highlight Oshawa's very colorful industrial history that is non-military in nature. Many companies located in this area because of its location in the heartland of both Ontario and Canada. With your help, the museum can tell the whole story of Oshawa and the surrounding area's contribution to the building of this great nation of ours. Anything you can do to assist in this effort will be very much appreciated. I'm Joel Alder, and thank you for